Hello, this is Dr. Matthews. We are going to talk about microbiology. We're going to talk about some of the history of microbiology, as well as some specifics about microscopes. Here we have some, this is a photo micrograph over on this side. And these are micrographs, they're drawn by hand. So on this side, you see a red blood cell, E. coli, rickettsia, very, very tiniest bacteria. In fact, at one point, they weren't considered to be a bacterium, down to poliovirus. And there are viruses that are much smaller than that. You can't see viruses with the naked eye. Now, over here, I think I'll use a pen. This is represents a human cell. This, is, this was made, actually, on a slide and taken a photo photograph of it. Okay, this is the actual outside of the cell. This is the nucleus of the cell. And all these glops of things on here are bacteria, all these. This elongated one is a bacilli. These little dots are cocci. The first microscopes were made by the Janssen brothers. Zacharias and Hans, and they were eyeglass makers, and they just got to playing around with lenses and discovered they could put two together and get magnification. It's in 1590, so that's a long time ago. And to them, it was a toy. They enjoyed playing with it. It was nothing spectacular or scientific. It was just some toys they gave to some kids. The next time we have anything in the history of microscopes is Antony van Leeuwenhoek. He was a Dutch or a Dutch cloth seller, native of Holland, and he lived 1632 to 1723, so he got to be an old guy. He sold cloth, and you need to grade cloth. Now, if you go to Walmart and you want some pillowcases, if you look at the thread count, if it says 125 threads per inch, you know that's a really, really bad pillowcase. Now, if it says 1,250 threads per inch, that's probably a good one. And plus, he also looked for differences in the cloth, like the threads, instead of being nice and even. That's not very even, is it? They might have breaks and things like that. So he definitely looked at these and tried to change them, you know, grade them, decide how much to charge, because people pay different prices for better cloth. Just like if you're going to buy a good pillowcase, you're going to pay a good price. Now, he um, made a really good microscope, better than anybody else, and therefore he was called the father of microscopy. Another thing was that he, I guess he got bored trying to sell cloth and nobody came in his shop. But he decided to take some stagnant water and put it on a whatever slide or whatever he used for a slide and look at it. He saw things swimming and that just went, whoa, those things are alive. He called them animacules. He said, little animacules swimming prettily along. Well, he saw protozoans, bacteria, and he also... Um, looked at filthy tooth scrapings and um, you can imagine the bacteria he saw for that. I mean, there wasn't Crest toothpaste or even toothbrushes. Some people who were wealthy might wipe their teeth off with cloth. Uh, he looked at sperm. He got a little activity there, I imagine. Okay, he would not tell anybody how he made his microscopes be so good. Uh, it was a secret, and he wouldn't change it. This is the actual drawings. These are fo these are micrographs, not photo micrographs. But he drew these in detail. Look at how much detail you have in these organisms. See the cilia on this, and I don't know what these organisms are. And in this one, he's showing a tiny organism, and then displaying the motion that it had, and you know just did immaculate drawings. And see, so he has to figure this, figure that, and then he told where he got it and what it looked like. Drew 
beautiful pictures and um, fantastic write-ups on them, but he wasn't a scientist. He's an amateur, and he sent his stuff, his books, his work, to the Royal Society of London, and they said, you're not a scientist, we can't look at your work. But it, some of them flipped through it and said, this is pretty interesting. And because he was probably the first person who, he's at least the first person who saw microscopic life and told about it. And if you think about it, just go back into those days, the thought of little microscopic organisms was just absurd. Anybody knew what causes diseases back in the early 1700s, 1800s. Evil spirits, of course, right? Yeah. Okay, now, a famous scientist in that day, Robert Hooke, was asked to look at some of his work, and he actually said it was really good and thought that it had merit and that he should be considered, you know, a worthwhile person. But he would not tell Hooke, Lewenhock would not tell Hooke, how he made the microscopes, why his were better. And uh, Hooke got annoyed with him, but he still said he was a pretty good at drawing. Okay, Robert Hooke lived about the same time, 1635 to 1703, so he didn't live to be as old. Um, he was an English scientist, and he did improve, and he actually shared his information on making microscopes. And he did some very excellent work. Uh, he looked at insects, sponges, protozoans, and a lot of different organisms, and he drew them in detail and published a work called Micrographia, because it was micrographs. If you see the time here, they were born almost the same year, but Lewenhock outlived him. Okay, Hook coined the word cell. Now, we all know we're made up of cells, and we're going to talk about cells and all sorts of things. You talked about that first thing when you took anatomy and physiology was to talk about how cells are made up, what they're made up of, what they look like. Well, he was the first person to notice that when you look at a piece of cork, every piece of cork that was sliced thin enough looked the same. And see these little boxes? That is the cells. But it was just absolutely amazing. It was a huge breakthrough. He said every single organism is made out of cells. And a huge breakthrough in science. Types of microscopes, light microscopes. This is a typical type of microscope. Generally, we're going to use compound microscopes with two lenses, the ocular lens and then the objective lens. And you use two lenses because they multiply the strength of the other. Um, if the ocular lens, that's the eyeball lens, multiplies four times and the objective lens uh, multiplies, um, uh, I said that backwards, the ocular is 10 times, the objective is four times, they multiply, you get 40. And a typical light microscope goes up to 100x, and that's about it. Now, you can go down to, well, there used to be Toys R Us. I guess you'd have to go to Amazon.com and buy a $100 uh, dollar microscope that would magnify it to a 1,000 times. But the picture is not going to have the same resolution. It's like getting a cheap camera and it's everything's pixelated. Well, it's the same thing with microscopes. The more expensive, the nicer the microscope, the better picture you get. This is the anatomy of a microscope. Ocular lenses here, eyeball lenses. And I will warn you that they will come off. Uh, you just can pull them out easily. And you don't want them to fall off accidentally. It's called the head. Now this will rotate around um, to the back. And I've noticed some students, and they claimed one of our teachers told them that you look at it from this direction and have the knobs behind you, but that's incorrect. This is the correct setup. Whoever told them that was wrong. Okay, this is an arm. This is the base. So if you're going to 
pick up a microscope and take it from point A to point B, you're going to have to gather up your cord first and then pick up the base, pick up the arm, and uh, get them to, uh, you hold it carefully, don't turn it upside down, and carefully watch where you walk and don't fall because the number one rule in a microscope lab is don't break the microscope. Okay, over here we have a rotating nose piece and we have different sizes of objective lenses. The smaller, the shorter one is lower magnification, probably 4x. And generally the best thing to do this is your stage right here. You see there's a little clip here. As you put your slide right here and you rotate around to the lowest power and then you take your adjustment knobs. Don't use a fine one yet. Start with this coarse knob and get it as close as you can and then you can do the fine adjustment afterwards. I remember I had a student that tore a microscope up by just taking this one around and 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 it made it to where eventually this stage would just go up and down on its own. Um, other parts of the microscope, of course, light switch, and this is one place a light switch might be. Uh, light control, you can make it brighter or darker. And then also you have a substage light here that's got an iris diaphragm and it has a lever that you can open or close. Think of the pupil on your eye. If it's constricted, less light gets in. If it's dilated, well, you can, it more gets in. Well, you can dilate this. And we have our condenser here. I think that's about the parts. Okay, fluorescent microscopes are somewhat interesting. Uh, these uh, will cause your specimen to fluoresce under ultraviolet light. And what you do is you take a specimen. Uh, one of the more common uses is if you think if somebody's been bitten by, say, a wild animal that had rabies and you're lucky enough to get your hands on the animal and it's been uh, killed and the brain has been uh, saved, they take that and they section it into microscopic pieces. They mix it with antibodies that are attached to stuff that will fluoresce, dyes that will fluoresce when you have an antibody antigen complex. So if the person has, I mean, well, the, hopefully it's not a person you're testing their brain, but it could be if you work you know, in a place where they test dead people, but say, you know, the dead fox or whatever animal, this is a positive rabies test. See these, that's positive. So whoever got bitten by this animal is gonna have to get shots. Now, unlike everybody says, it's not 27 shots in the belly because they're so inflammatory that you can't walk if they give them in the arm or leg. That was the original stuff. They're much better now. You get two or three shots and then they check your titer. But if you've never had been exposed to rabies and had shots before, they also will take serum that's hyperimmune to rabies and inject it directly into the wound. And that apparently is what hurts. Now they weren't doing that when I was first exposed to rabies, thankfully. So I have already been exposed. I had four exposures. And so I've never had to have a serum. The first was a mule. The other three were cats. Never been exposed to a rabid dog. We had one we thought was rabid, but he came back negative. Okay. Electron microscopes, uh, we have transmission electron microscopes. The beam, electron beam goes through the specimen and you can look at the organelles in extreme detail. And that's how we know what the organelles look like. Electron micrograph of a neuron. And you can see some of the different things, but they're not labeled. This resembles something like an endoplasmic reticulum. Yeah, and your guess is probably as good as mine because I don't see anything that really looks exactly like the things in the book. We could call that a ribosome if we wanted to, but I'm making it up. 
Then we have scanning electron microscopes. They just look at the surface of an object. This is really cool. This looks like worms going through Swiss cheese, but it's actually Campylobacter bacteria, very small, and they're sitting on filter paper so that they can see them, but some of them are trying to crawl through the pores, as you see here, and it really looks disgusting, but I think it's cool too. And you won't see these electron microscopes or fluorescent microscopes unless you work in a research laboratory, a huge major hospital, the CDC, somewhere like that. You're not going to find one at Southern Crescent. We just have regular light microscopes. Okay, now we're switching back in time a little bit, 1786. But the immunology, the first time anyone was immunized to anything. Now, in 1786, they didn't know what caused smallpox. This is smallpox, and it killed many, many people. These horrible, horrible lesions would get all over your body, and you died. And just, you know, multitudes of people died of this stuff. It was horrible. Well, Edward Jenner had taken a note that milkmaids, I guess these are women who milk cows, tended to not get smallpox. They were immune. He also observed that most of the cows in the area had cowpox. Now, if we, have, if we see scabs on a cow's udder nowadays, we're not going to milk the cow. We're going to take her off the milking line, and I'd probably you know, scream. But anyway, this is pretty horrible looking stuff. But what he did was he got a volunteer, uh, somebody, a little boy that had never been exposed to smallpox. He paid their parents to borrow him for a little while. I can't imagine, but that's what he did. And he ground up some of these scabs and mixed them in solution and injected them into the skin of the little boy. He got a horrible welt just like this, but he only got one. And then when another smallpox epidemic went around, he, uh, they didn't get it. It was, I mean, he didn't get it. He was immune. Other people died all around him, but he was immune. So this became very popular to get cows with cowpox and make you some vaccine. Uh, vaccines are a little bit more precisely made these days, but that was a good start and it really did a good job. This is a total change of uh, direction. The book, whoever wrote your book, is more ADD than I am, and it's almost difficult to imagine if you only knew me. I can get distracted. I can leave the classroom and come back. I not come back because I'm reading something on the internet. So anyway, that's just, but the book just goes every which way. But spontaneous generation is a theory, also called abiogenesis, that life develops from non-living matter. It just whoop, appears. And people truly believe that living things can come out of non-living matter. Now, then there were some people that were against it that said, no, that's not true. There were many experiments. Louis Pasteur finally ended the conflict, but we'll talk about him in just a minute. Aristotle started this whole mess. Look at that, 384 to 322 BC. That's a long time. And this idea went on for close to 2,000 years. It was a long, long time to be so wrong. Now, most people had a pretty good idea where human babies came from. They knew they came, you know, from hanky-panky and get together and, you know, mom and dad get together and then the baby is born. But what they did not know was where smaller things came from. Uh, back to where babies came from, uh, there was even in ancient Egypt, there are writings of where people were taught you can take a peach seed and put it inside the uterus of a, ca a, a camel to keep her from getting pregnant so she won't be out of work for a while if you have enough camels. 
Okay, this was evidence for spontaneous generation, and it seems to be very good evidence. The Nile River floods every year. The mud becomes very rich silt. Billions of frogs appear. So, voila! Frogs come from mud. Makes lots of sense. And it does if you look at it from their point of view. They're wrong, but their point of view, it was quite logical. One of my favorite ideas was that in most science books, uh, there were recipes for how to make your lab rats. There weren't just places you could order lab rats from or lab mice. You had to make your own, and they made them. Um, what they did was they took a jar. There's another book I saw that had a wooden box with holes down here. It seems like a better recipe. In this one, you take sweaty underwear, and then you put wheat in the jar. Leave it alone in a dark place like an open barn and come back and voila, you have mice. Uh, and so that proves they made mice, right? Well, wrong, but that is that these were in tech. This is in textbooks, how to make mice. And if you want to try to see if you can make some mice and you have some extra sweaty underwear, this will probably work. I would not suggest that you try this at home. Okay, now I don't know how many of you know about open air markets. You've been to craft fairs maybe where they have arts and crafts laid out on tables that people go around and buy what they want to buy and look at what they don't want to buy and pick up things and handle them and put them down. Well, that's the way, especially in 1688, that food was sold. You got meat that's just slopped out on the table and the problem with it was when it sat there for a couple of days, it got maggots on it. Well, you know, the sellers just rinse them off. Ah, it's just a maggot, extra protein, won't hurt anything. Um, Francisco Reddy said he thought that the flies he saw hanging around might have something to do with maggots. Maybe they were laying eggs. And everybody said, that's ridiculous, no. So first he sealed a jar off and there were no maggots. Uh, when it sat out for several days. The meat was still probably disgusting, but no maggots on it, which is a bit better. Now, everybody said there's no air, so he tried a gauze covering. Now, there's air coming through the pores, of the, but the flies can't get in it, so no maggots. Now, and then he had an open jar, and he got maggots. Now, that seems like that's proof Unfortunately, most scientists did not take him seriously. No one believed him, and he was disappointed that they didn't believe his work. I want to mention one thing about open-air meat markets and vegetable markets. They still exist, and I'm not talking in third-world countries. I'm talking in some of the pretty places. My son studied abroad in Oxford, England for a year, and they had open-air markets. He said they'd have a refrigerator truck or something but they'd set the food out in the air where people could see it and you just buy what you need for the day and take it home and cook it and it seems pretty scary but he didn't die okay now John Needham decided no spontaneous generation is true and this is way later so he's going to prove it. So he boiled some broth. This is in a sealed container. And left it several days later, he got bacterial growth. And so he could see the turbidity, the, the murkiness of it. And then if you looked at it under a microscope, you could see movement. So he knew that he still had uh, growth. So he said, aha, spontaneous generation. He didn't know about endospores. An endospore, let's just say, I'm real bad at drawing, but let's say this is your bacteria. The endospore may grow around it and protect it in a hard time. And things like botulism have endospores. Anthrax does. Now, anthrax, you can bury a cow that died of anthrax. 
dig him up 50 years later, there's no sign of the cow, but the anthrax can still be down there and kill you. Botulism. If Aunt Susie home cans her green beans and she doesn't use a pressure canner and she just heats them up on the stoves and serves them to you, don't eat them. They may have botulism in them. Clostridium botulism. And any of the clostridial organisms make endospores. Other clostridial organisms, tetanus, gas gangrene, they go on. Okay. Now, another guy came along, Spallanzani. It looks like it says spaghetti to me. But he tried an experiment. Uh, he said that, well, that it, they need no air to grow. So he heated the broth and flask is sealed. He got no growth. He said, hooray, you know, we've got no growth. Then he opens the flask. He gets bacterial growth. And he says, well, they, they needed the air to grow. And then here, he heated the broth, left it open, and they immediately grew. And uh, people said, well, the microbes need the air. Um, and so this had nothing to do with, they thought this was spontaneous generation. Even here, you just had to have air. Now, Louis Pasteur, in 1859, he did this experiment. Now, he knew that spontaneous generation was a crock. He knew that life came from life. He'd figured it out. He'd observed life enough to know. So he wanted to see, how can I go around getting people to believe it? And so he designed this special flask. To prove it, you had to have air in the flask. So he had this uh, sort of swan neck shaped flask. And his idea, and it apparently worked, was that the bacteria, where they're coming from, is they're falling out of the air. And they might get here, but they're going to stop here, not getting into the broth. So he boils it, and it stayed bacterial free for weeks, maybe months, I think. A long time. Then he broke the flask off it wasn't any time just a few days just tons of bacteria was his experiment better than the one with the maggots no uh, was it better than most of the others no but what he did was he was a persuasive speaker and a persuasive writer and this is why you have to study all those english classes and take public speaking you've got to be able to convince people that you know what you're talking about. And that's how he got it across. He, he did the same basic experiments, but he convinced people he was right. This is jumping around a little bit, and this is not in your book. This is out of an article of the American Veterinary Medical Association. I think it was 1985. I don't have the copy in front of me. But in 1900, this was before milk was pasteurized. Over 100,000 American children died each year from drinking store-bought milk. Um, little babies, two years up, two year old, you give them milk, they get sick, they die. Now, how many children die from drinking milk now? Zero. I mean, and like, I guess they'll say choke on it. I mean, you know, this just, it doesn't kill them. Now, this is a typical milk line back in the 1900s or before. Uh, these are little boys, and that's why people had all these kids, is so they could milk the cows and do other farm chores. And they wanted a lot of them because they had a lot of cows. And so before the kids went to school, they got up. They have two buckets, one you sit on and then one you milk the cow into. They didn't worry about washing the udder. There's flies hanging around. She could have had manure on her. Tails swishing around, not secured. And then when they're through milking in the bucket, someone takes those buckets and they pour them into a larger container that's covered with cheesecloth. And it gets out any big chunks of manure and flies. And so it's clean milk at that point, right? Maybe not. So then where we go from there, 
That milk is then picked up by a guy with a horse or mule drawn wagon. This mule is sad. He needs more food. Or he could be 35 years old. And they picked up the jugs of milk that the farmer's family had put out by the road. And it picks it up and they take it to a bottling company. And they wash the bottles because nobody's going to buy milk with dirty bottles. And they, they clean them up and they pour the milk up. And then they take it and they deliver it to your house. And about five or six in the morning, you go out there and you have, voila, fresh milk to drink. Fresh by 1900 standards. Now, my grandfather talked about milking cows before school. And then he talked about had had to walk to school five miles in the snow. And I remember one day asking my father where my grandfather grew up. It was my mother's father. And he said, San Antonio, Texas. Why? I was thinking, hmm, I think my grandpa exaggerated. But he did have to milk cows twice a day. Now, modern milking and pasteurization, you see his work, his name right out there, Pasteur, Louis Pasteur. They go about things totally differently. They have a clean, sanitized milking parlor, and water flushes over it with disinfectant every, between every round of cows. And the cows line up. The bossiest cow gets milked first. As soon as she's through getting milked, she gets a treat, and that's why they do it that way. So, why well, the cows do it that way. The, uh, whoever is doing the milking will take these udders, and they'll clean them, scrub them, uh, scrub the teats, dry them, and then they'll squirt a little bit of milk out of each teat onto a little surface that detects signs of bacterial infection. If she comes up okay, they then dip the teats into a disinfectant just to clean them further, wipe them off with a towel that's been washed and with Clorox and dried, and hook her up to this sterile milker that goes through a sterile tubing that goes into a sterile container. And each of these cows are going through the same thing. And when it's through, it'll drop off and she backs up and goes and gets her food. And then they have to clean up, you know, all this up. Well, that big container of milk will be heated just under a boil, that's pasteurization, and then cool down as fast as possible and put into a truck. Now, one other thing I didn't mention is they also test cows. I don't know, some diseases every year, some diseases twice a year. Tuberculosis, uh, brucellosis, things that can people can catch from sick cows. So if you want to drink raw, unpasteurized milk from a dairy, uh, go for it. I, I, I drank one glass of milk that somebody milked from their own cow. And it was fresh from that morning. And it was really good. But I sat there and worried so bad. I, mean, I was paranoid for weeks that I was going to catch something deathly and die. But I didn't. Okay, now we'll come back to pasture and the germ theory of disease in a minute. But this is, see, he died when, by the time Pasteur published a lot of his work. Ignis Semmelweis. He discovered that, well, he noticed a lot of babies died when they were delivered by doctors in hospitals. But when they were delivered by midwives at home, they did great. And he noticed also that the doctors would come straight after doing an autopsy, wipe their hands on their pants. They didn't wash their hands. And then they deliver the baby, then wonder why mommy got sick and baby died. And the doctors just, they weren't washing their hands. Now, he was not the kind of person who just was quiet about what he said. He really, really freaked out. He called these people murderers because they didn't wash their hands. And he screamed and they got tired of him. And the common rebuke was doctors are gentlemen and gentlemen are clean. Well, no. Anybody who just did an autopsy on somebody who had um, died of gangrene is not clean. But that's what they thought. 
So he was really discouraged. He had really high strung man and he had great success in his hospitals, but yet he got fired because of his teachings and he was replaced with someone who didn't wash their hands. So he started drinking and running with women of ill repute and that showed a sure sign that he was insane in uh, the 1800s. So his colleagues tricked him to go down to an insane asylum. Then they grabbed him and threw him in a jail cell, basically. And he fought and he fought and he fought and he got a cut. And ironically, it got infected and he died of septicemia after fighting bacterial infections his whole life. So he was a very sad man. But all his screaming and yelling and ultimate death brought attention to others. Now, Oliver Wendell Holmes, he was a Harvard doctor, and he had noticed, you know, the work of Semmelweis, and he also noticed that if people didn't wash their hands, uh, mamas and babies tended to die. And so he said, there's something contagious in this, uh, in, on these hands and they just they didn't know what it was vapors of contagion they call the disease papural fever but it's not just one disease it's just filth in general and um, he started making people wash their hands and he had noticed also that midwives had a greater success than doctors at delivering babies and nobody dying well Women, even in the 1800s, were taught to wash their hands and to wash stuff because they had mothers. And I don't know about any of y'all, but if I hadn't washed my hands, my mother would have whipped my hide. But anyway, it's just a difference in attitude. And they weren't around, the midwives weren't around as much filth either. So very radical to wash one's hands. Um... The germ theory of disease uh, was starting to develop, just you know, thinking about these things. Well, Pasteur noticed, well, I can slow down microbes in wine and it won't spoil. I can kill microbes in milk and it won't spoil as fast. Well, is there any way that that could cause infectious disease? And that was something huge, you know, what a bizarre theory. Could germs, bacteria, cause disease? Well, they, he wrote up that it could, and Joseph Lister decided to take it a step farther, and he wrote up a list of protocols. Don't y'all love working in a place where you got a protocol for everything? You got to do everything a certain way, you know, turn your nose this way and your chin that way. So many protocols, but he had very strict protocols. And they had to disinfect things, actually wash their surgical instruments. What a bizarre idea. Um, he sprayed aerosol disinfectants on stuff. And he basically introduced a protocol for aseptic technique. Asepsis means without sepsis, sepsis is infection. And Listerine was named after him. Okay, Robert Koch lived in the same general time. He published this a little bit later than a lot of Pasteur stuff was published. But he took anthrax and injected it in a mouse. The mouse died. That's amazing, isn't it? Then he took, he identified the anthrax. He grew it in culture, identified it under the microscope. Took some of these organisms, turned them into an injection, injected that mouse. Well, that mouse died. Then he took some samples, I think he took blood out of them, did another culture. There's pure anthrax. So he's shown a cause and effect between anthrax and dying. So he came up with Koch's postulates, and these are very important for research. If to prove cause and effect, the microbe must be present in every animal with a disease, 
has to be absent in healthy animals. Can be isolated and grown in pure culture outside the host. The cultured microorganisms must cause the same disease in the inoculated animals, and the microorganism must then be isolated from the inoculated animal. So what we're show, what we're showing here is cause and effect. Let's see, I, I write this bad with a pencil and effect. EF. I wonder if I could type with this thing. CT. Okay, did it cause it? Now, just because someone has a fever and they're sick, that doesn't mean they have COVID. Uh, it, it, you have to test them. It could be the flu. Maybe they've got strep throat. You've got to test and find out what is causing your disease. Okay, and that is all for now. So. We'll go on to the next section later.